Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to our live webcast, Achieving Agility in Procurement Operations, BEAM's Transformation Journey, hosted by the Institute for Supply Management and sponsored by Scout RFP. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and you may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the addition, or, or excuse me, the slides or additional research papers by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window, and then click the Submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left at the end of today's program. However, if we're not able to get to your individual question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. And at this time, we recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. This will allow the slides to advance automatically throughout the event. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to the presentation, Achieving Agility in Procurement Operations, BEAM's Transformation Journey. We are joined today by our speakers, Brian Golden, Senior Director of America's Procurements at BEAM Suntory. Brian Golden is a Senior Procurement Director with strong analytical skills and the ability to utilize lean fundamentals to drive value. He has a strong global, or excuse me, he has strong global experience with a diverse supply chain background. And joining him today is Grant Shirk, Vice President of Marketing at Scout RFP. Grant joined Scout from Vera and Box, where he helped customers to protect and, or excuse me, helped customers protect and collaborate on their most critical content. With a background in enterprise platforms and customer experience design, Grant loves building products that empower people and allow them to communicate in new ways. It's with great pleasure I now turn this special session over to Grant to begin. Grant, take it away. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate the introduction, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. We don't often get a chance to talk about a, a large brand who's been able to really transform the, not only the way they operate, but the results that they've delivered for the team. Uh, and that's a big part of what we're going to talk through today. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of information and thoughts on what is the value of a highly engaged team, and then we'll bring Brian on to talk through the before and after of the transformation that he helped lead at Beam Suntory. Uh, from there, that's going to dig into how we affected this change, how they affected this change uh, with both their plan and strategy as well as the tactics and the tools they put in place to make it happen. And then we'll wrap that up into a bit of a blueprint for those of you joining us today to walk through and plan out your own transformation. That should leave us, hopefully, Chris, for 10-15 uh, minutes for questions at the end. And hopefully we have a pretty lively conversation to, to go. To get started, I wanted to open up this idea of why this topic is so relevant to us and what we're hearing from our customers and what they've been asking to learn about most. Uh, I think a key component to the transformation story is that everybody does want to move their organization forward. Uh, there's Nobody really wants to say, no, we're good with where we're at. We don't need to get any better. We all know that in today's business environment, progress, optimization, and improvement is key. But what we found is if you go out and you ask, if you ask Gartner, if you ask IDC, they have a ton of information, but very often you wind up with quotes like they want to have, have on the screen. And I, I love the, the sourcing and procurement team at Gartner, but this, this quote I think sums it up very well, is that most CTOs will say that the most important reason for investing in strategic sourcing tools is to transform strategic sourcing. And, and that's a little bit of circular logic there and, and not that helpful, but what I think is an important conversation is, well, why are the tools important to transformation and what can they actually do in the first place? And so to get that, I wanted to get a little bit of context from everyone here today about what your priorities are and why you might be either thinking about evaluating or seeking new tools. So I pushed a poll out to all of you here, and these are some of the, the top reasons that we've heard from our customers. But what I'd love to hear from you uh, in the next 30 to 45 seconds here are what are your top reasons 
um, either for joining this webinar or for seeking new tools for your organization. Whether it's increasing productivity, trying to get a handle over your process, uh, or even to um, start better measuring, analyzing, or showing the value of your, your organization. Would love to understand from you uh, exactly what it is that you are, uh, what, what you're seeing. As I look over this, Brian, I know this is something that you're going to spend a bunch of time on, but we've got about a third of the audience responding so far. We've got a bit of a dead heat as we go. Um, let me see. Give everyone I'm a hoping we're not getting the last answer here. We're not investing, or maybe all of the above. I, I, I think I'm going to disappoint you a little bit on this one. It's looking about 20% right now as we're not investing yet. There, there's a little bit of hopeful there, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and close this out and push this forward. And here we go. So in this, let's see we digest this a little bit. And Brian, I'd love your take on it too. Uh, but it looks like the, the top three that we're seeing here is definitely productivity. Uh, we, we tend to be very focused on those operational metrics and starting to look at ways for these tools to help transform our processes. I think we'll, we'll touch on that a bit too. And then definitely tools as we've seen in this new era of instrumentation and particularly SaaS applications, trying to get the, the measuring, analyzing, and showing procurement. And then like I said, uh, we've got a little bit better, but about 17% of the people who aren't investing yet. Maybe we can change some hearts and minds today. But, but one thing I think is really interesting about this, uh, actually this is a little surprising to me, is the, the small amount who said that their, their drive, their top reason for seeking new tools is employee satisfaction and engagement. I think that's, that's kind of different from your story at Beam. Is that right, Brian? Yes, it's, uh, you know, and I think it's, you know, possibly the, the way we think about why we are going after, you know, employee uh, engagement. And, you know, it's, it's really a driver of some of the reasons that I think people chose. And, and if we, we'll get into, I think, why, why our reason to be is probably similar to a lot of people's. Um, okay. But I'll, I'll take it forward here and, and kind of just talk through the background of, of Beam and how that uh, starts to be. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. So I think uh, probably the, the reason maybe a lot of folks have joined today is they heard Beam Centauri, and uh, you know it's a quite, quite an exciting uh, company and, and product line. Uh, you know, we are in the spirits industry, if uh, you know, people are not aware of, of Jim Beam. Uh, but we've got a very interesting history and a very long history. And, you know, when I joined the company, which was about four years ago, I was shocked to understand that Jim Beam was founded in 1795. And, you know, it, it kind of gives you this impression that you're just here, you know, to shepherd the company on to, to the, next, the next phase. And the company is, you know, longer lasting than, than you can really comprehend. And it's, it, it's really an interesting thing. Um, we are a pretty broad company. We have lots of spirits brands. And in 2014, we were acquired by Centauri Holdings. And they also have a very long history, uh, being the number one producer of Japanese whiskey in the world. And they were founded in 1899. And, you know, why, why is this such a, such a big deal? We had the biggest uh, portfolio, premium portfolio whiskey of any spirits company in the world, and we have a very global footprint that we've never had before. And with that becomes a lot of challenges of continuing to grow and continuing to uh, make our mark in the world, but do it on a, on a much bigger way. And it's difficult to do so without uh, making some investments and, and making some upgrades to, to go along the way. Uh, you know, when we only had one product, it's, it's one story, but when you've got uh, some of the best whiskeys in the world, uh, Hibiki, Yamazaki, Booker's. Uh, we've got to we've got to do our best to to really focus on the quality, and you know give ourselves time to to not get uh, into the too much detail that uh, doesn't drive value. And that's one of the reasons why we want to go after a tool, right? and that's part of the transformation. But linked to our corporate uh, vision into action, our number one priority at the end of the day is people. 
And we do believe people is our competitive edge. And because of that, we want to give people the, the tools and the capability to think outside of the box. Right? We want to give people the, the reason for coming to work every day and for being excited. And that's not spending a lot of time, you know, launching RFPs um, or doing the same thing day in, day out. And so, you know, building markets, creating brands, these are all things that the procurement team has a key fundamental scope to. And anything we can do to, to make their, their life more uh, easier and more efficient gives them more time to, to do those things. And I think there's a, an interesting uh, statistic, and, and this comes from PwC, and really linked back to, you know, we, we wanted to impact employee satisfaction and engagement. You know, companies with highly engaged teams, 51% less turnover, two and a half times uh, increase in outcomes, and higher profitability. You know, and if, what is procurement's job? You know, it's a lot of things. Um, cost savings, obviously, is one of them. But at the end, you know, I can only cost save by reducing a, a price of a, of a widget so many times. And so having an engaged employees is really the kind of magic sauce that we've found to, to continue to add value to the organization. And again, that's, that's why we've looked at uh, technology, process, and tools to, to bring us there. And I think that last statistic there is very interesting. 51% um, lower turnover, and you know, anybody who's in procurement knows the job market's very strong, as it is for many industries. Um, I can say since I've been here in procurement, uh, we've had zero, absolutely zero, voluntary turnover in procurement, which is, you know, from folks I talk to, an outstanding uh, representation of uh, you know, keeping an engaged team, um, it's somewhat surprising to myself it's actually zero, uh, but that is, you know, one of the reasons why we do make investments uh, to keep people engaged. So I do want to switch over just, you know, now we've got some of the history, but talk a little bit more detail about what did procurement look like, uh, you know, several years ago. And I think this, this might resonate with a lot of folks on the line today. Uh, lots of one-to-one -one email communication, uh, which wasn't efficient, um, you know, and limited, you know, bandwidth of individuals to go after new new areas of opportunity. We also had a very strong tribal knowledge. Um, you know, we had a lot of people in the company who knew how things were done, and they had an excellent understanding of uh, capabilities or process, uh, but it wasn't documented, and it was very difficult to teach somebody who didn't have 15, 20 years of experience how to do something. And, and that linked back to not having standard processor tools. And, and all these things combined, where we don't have good communication, we don't have good knowledge, and not enough time to work on items, we had suboptimal negotiations. And this, this was a kind of a, quite a consistent pattern uh, that we were seeing in the company. And obviously one that, you know, with a company that's been around as long as Beam Centauri, you don't want to be the person responsible for uh, you know, making the company uh, not succeed in the future. So we, we had a high, high bar to pass to say, hey, we, we've got to do something different uh, to keep this company around uh, for several hundred more years. So our goal at the end you know, was moving away from savings as the only metric and moving towards total value delivery. Uh, some of the ways we, we look at this, and, and, I, you know, and I will be the first one to say savings is still the biggest uh, target, and I think you know, that is uh, the crux of how we will still continue to be managed or, or, or uh, valued. But swinging from just savings to total value delivery, what does that mean specifically? One of the big projects we're, we're, we're driving forward is uh, complexity reduction for manufacturing and driving consumer-focused improvements. Historically, that might not be a procurement activity. Uh, but one of the things we've done is we've set up the procurement team in such a way that really wherever we see value or opportunity now, we go after. And so we see a lot of value and opportunity in reducing complexity as the number of SKUs and the complexity of the global uh, marketplace has increased. And the country we, countries we sell our products into has increased. 
there's been a lot of complexity introduced, and one of our key focuses is to reduce that complexity, which in turn will, you know, drive employee engagement, reduce cost, and we also think, you know, and we've seen this definitely improve quality, and we've got a very, very high focus on quality. Uh, you know, the second goal we had was being the first point of contact for innovation. You know, so often uh, when I first joined, we would come in and you know, a project was ready to launch, ready to be in market a month later, and procurement was involved at that point. And we, we are now at the point where procurement is involved, you know, sometimes, you know, years in advance of the project launching. And, and that helps us really help drive design, uh, drive strategy uh, to, to become a more holistic view and partner with our suppliers to deliver uh, projects and products that, you know, exceed our customer expectations. Uh, you know, we are now kind of one of the first steps where marketing has a new idea, and that's a great place to be, and it's a great place to, to drive sustained value delivery. Um, the last one is standardizing the pipeline-based process, and one of the big challenges we had was, you know, we didn't know until the last day of the year, you know, what were our numbers going to look like. Um, we didn't have a good understanding of who was accountable for projects and how many projects were being worked on. And I think that was one of the big items that came up in the uh, the questionnaire earlier. Um, but this is again one of the reasons why we've we've invested and we have have invested, um, you know, to convert a lot of our tracking that was done in Excel um, to do it online and, and build a lot of global capability to to see projects and understand where they are and really partner with their finance team so they've got better visibility as well. So that's kind of a pretty high goal and, uh, you know, how do we want to get there and, you know, really does go back to that standardizing process and tools, um, you know, tracking that progress through milestones. Um, point three here I think is, is an interesting one which is maybe not typical but, you know, we did invest in, in conferences and, you know, we are, we are a global company with global teams. And how did we make this transformation uh, quick? Uh, you know, we've done it in, you know, call it 24 months. Uh, it was really bringing people together, um, you know, not, you know, teaching people from a distance, not, you know, giving people a standard process to go follow, but actually having people uh, work together in the same place uh, at least once a year. And that allowed us to do something that, you know, could have taken three, four years and do it in, you know, 18 to 24 months. Um, you know, uh, moving away from just bidding to total value delivery, as we talked about, and, uh, you know, continuing to, to drive uh, visibility for, for our leadership. So tracking progress, you know, the KPIs, uh, that we really focused on, instead of focusing on just what is your savings number, we said, hey, focusing on a savings number is a difficult way to get savings. Um, you know, it's almost your output, right? It's, it's your live measure. And we said, well, what can we track up front as KPIs that if we did good on these KPIs, we know we would have uh, a strong output, which would be savings or value delivery. And so one of the things we focused on was increasing uh, the number of opportunities we went after. Um, and we'll have a statistic on this later, but we've drastically increased uh, the number of areas we focus on and uh, activities we, in, we engage in. Second to that is we, we frequently found that activities are lasting too long. And, you know, it might take somebody a year to get a contract in place or uh, run an RFP that took six months. And one of our goals now is to move um, projects through stages, and, and really we're trying to move projects forward in, in roughly 30 days on average. And we, we've got a view that half of the projects we start, we, we don't actually follow through on, and we decide very quickly that they're, they're not uh, a good use of time, and we move on to something else. And this is unusual. Um, it's difficult, but knowing that you shouldn't have to close everything that you go look at, um, and it, it drives a lot of engagement. And 
you know, that's number three, you know, the efficiency per employee. We don't want people working on something that won't drive value. And so as soon as we know it won't or there's something that's more valuable, we go after it. And that is truly very unique about Beam Centurion, the way uh, the, the team works. There are no fixed categories that people go after. You know, there is no category manager for glass bottles. Somebody could be purchasing glass bottles or negotiating glass bottles in one day, and the next day uh, they could be, you know, supporting a, a marketing activity, or they could be supporting uh, a hotel RFP. And really, we flow to work. Uh, we let process and uh, opportunity dictate where we go. But it creates a very uh, creative and curious organization to, to naturally try to find opportunities. And that's been one of the biggest wins um, and one of the best things of using a pipeline process uh, as we have through Scout is everybody can see opportunities and put opportunities in the system to go after. And, you know, this slide just kind of just calls it out. The, you know, step one there was we said, hey, if we have a pipeline, it's got to be simple to use. And uh, we, we looked at quite a few different options. Excel is simple until you get past maybe 30 projects, um, and then it's not. And so we, we quickly decided that Scout was, was how we were going to go after um, creating a simple uh, pipeline. And uh, that's really driven uh, a, a really simple way to, to measure ourselves and, and, again, drive that engagement with the team. And part of that engagement, you know, drives people to want to work here as well and, and reduces the turnover. And, you know, linking that back, you know, what does that mean, hard numbers? Uh, you know, that's all, that all sounds good. Um, beyond just zero turnover, we've, we've had a uh, 200% you know, you know, increase in number of projects started over the past two years. 170% um, uh, increase in the performance of those outcomes. and are, you know, as uh, scored by an independent party, our employee engagement scores, uh, which were already uh, rather high, have also improved by 12% uh, over a two-year period, which is an uh, astronomical increase uh, in such a short period and something we're very proud of. Yeah, I think, um, Brian, if I can jump in here, I think this is fantastic. I think what's really interesting is how closely this tracks to those PricewaterhouseCoopers I guess I have to call them PwC now, those PwC stats from, be from the beginning, where you were seeing two to two and a half X improvement in business outcomes uh, from more engaged teams. Did, did these two stats kind of track along with each other as you were driving engagement, you started to see the increase in projects that were able to be started and completed? Sorry, you broke up there for a second. Can you say the no. last part? No problem. I was, I was making the comment about how well this ties to the PwC metrics and benchmarks around engagement and business outcomes. Oh, yes. And, yeah. and so my, my question was, is as you saw those employee engagement scores ramp up, uh, was, it, is it, was it tightly correlated to the, the, the projects started and completed in the pipeline? Yeah, I mean, the timing was, was almost identical uh, for the two sets of measures. And, you know, you know, I guess it's again focusing on, you know, do you focus on, on lead measures or lag measures and, you know, higher employee engagement, you know, score, I, you know, that's directly why, you know, we could have more projects pushed through, right? And so, I, you know, I kind of see that that 12% is, is the lead measure for, for why we were able to, to improve the results. Um, and again, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, if we just said, hey, we want to improve, you know, number of projects started, you know, that to me isn't the right metric to, to focus on it's how do we improve you know improve engagement or make people's lives easier and you know the output of you know actioning more projects and delivering more value will become an outcome of that and you know we've definitely seen that and that aligns to the research. Awesome, uh, that's great, thank you. And I think what these together really start to paint is that that bigger picture of what we're all trying to accomplish. Uh, you've brought a really uh, unique point of view around driving employee engagement as how you're going to drive 
these bigger outcomes. Uh, but I think it also maps to what we're hearing from other customers and other sourcing leaders and procurement leaders in the market is that it's that shift you referred to at the beginning. You've got to move with, you know, where, when you're, when you're an, not an ancient company, but a very mature company. Uh, it's not, you can't just focus on cost savings anymore. Like you said, you can only negotiate the price of any given widget or part to a certain point. Uh, and I thought Neil uh, over at Uber put this really well. He said that the traditional mindset of procurement is shifting. We have to get to a point where we're now focused on continually improving and reevaluating how we buy to make sure we get the best outcomes. And to me, that encapsulates really nicely this idea of people, process, and tools in order to affect that change. And that is, that's the opportunity that we're often talking about when we're talking about transformation. It's not just how do I drive an extra few percentage points, but exactly what you were able to achieve, which is how do I improve the throughput of my organization. And if you go back to those those two metrics, the two times more projects on the top and the 170% more projects that were successfully completed, uh, that is a great metric to look at to say, you know, are we actually more effective in this process? And then what are the inputs and outputs to it? Um, the reasons to do this are manifest, but when you start looking at things from this point of view, there's really three to me that pop out. The first is definitely one that we saw in the poll earlier about driving that full visibility into planned and active projects. And this is critical not only to understand where there are bottlenecks or where to manage up and promote the impact of your team upward in the organization, but also to identify those things that are working really well and those opportunities, like he mentioned, for savings. If I can see the opportunities coming in, I can better prioritize and assign those out to the best people in the organization to tackle them. The next one is really about getting those, those insights. One of the key benefits of moving to a new tool or bringing a new tool or process into an organization is being able to centralize a lot of that information. You mentioned just a couple minutes ago that a spreadsheet works great until you've got about 30 projects going, at which point that was where it started to break down for you. And by building that centralized place that everyone is using, uh, you know, there are centralized tools that people will use and centralized tools that are kind of like a big cathedral with nothing in them. Uh, they're, they're not utilized. They're not easily easy to adopt. And using that as some of your criteria is important as well. And then, of course, this comes down to ultimately your ability to measure and analyze. It's those leading and trailing metrics uh, that we see along the way. This is where we wanted to get to the blueprint part of the conversation. And I think in many ways, there's a bit of an unexpected source for this blueprint. Uh, we often see sales as, if not the adversary, certainly the person sitting across the table from us as we work through the latter stages of a negotiation. But if you look back to those, those three areas of full visibility into projects, working towards the optimization of that pipeline, and ultimately measuring, analyzing, and driving that continuous improvement, there's a really, really great blueprint that exists in the world of, of sales, and that is this idea of the funnel or the pipeline. Uh, this is, a, I think, a, a simple exercise, but one that can be incredibly valuable. If you take the traditional sales funnel, and there's a hundred different versions of this, uh, but they all boil down to a fairly simple template here where you look at the opportunities coming into the top, you start qualifying and digging into those opportunities and building a pipeline of work and tasks and engagements that, that your team needs to work through and get those assigned out. Then, of course, there is the process of selling as I'm doing the education, bringing stakeholders and new resources to the table, and ultimately advancing the value of the conversation that you're trying to have with the other party. And then there are the last two stages, which we're all very, very familiar with around negotiation, contracting, and then ultimately moving into post-sale activity. If you map that against our world of hey, sourcing... Rand, can I, can I yes. just interrupt you for one second, sorry? Uh, yeah, please. this... You know, this sourcing funnel, and the first time I saw it, you know, you shared this. And I think a lot of us sometimes get stuck of, you know, you get pulled in and you're just, you know, at the contract stage or the negotiation stage. 
but it's really interesting because, you know, I think, you know, for many, many years, the sales funnel concept has been out there, and, and the sourcing funnel probably wasn't as developed, and it's, you know, it's, it's amazing how well they match, but it's you know, just a very clear kind of indicator of process, and it really does match very closely uh, the way we've gone about it, and seeing that it actually is a thing and not just something we figured out on our own is, is a very, uh, in, you know, interesting uh, piece of information. I'm glad to hear it, uh, and I hope it, it, it's a useful model. Oftentimes, you know, these frameworks can be uh, dismissed as overly simplistic, but sometimes it's just that shift of focus, and I think a big thing for, uh, from what I heard you say, but also what we're hearing from our other customers is by putting this into place, it's actually forcing people to think about their process differently, and particularly looking at opportunity identification and pipeline development as critical capabilities and characteristics really actually uh, helps people move their process further up and, and get more visibility into what's coming down the pipeline and then better prioritization of the work that we're putting in. Uh, and so you're right, what we do see is that really great, really transformative sourcing teams are starting to implement pipeline-like processes, whether they're doing it organizationally or whether they're doing it through a tool. And they're even starting to measure that pipeline. You know, we talked early about the KPIs that you set out to measure. The KPIs that you pick early in this process have a big impact on your outcome. Uh, it's the idea of start with the why or start with the end in mind. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we going to measure along the way? And then how do we use that as a, as a map or a game plan for where we're trying to go? And if you, again, steal from sales uh, and even a little bit from, from marketing and you look at what are great indicators or initial kind of operational KPIs to look at when you're looking at a pipeline, certainly as you go from stage to stage, that conversion rate between stage is an amazing indicator of both deal velocity as well as team capacity. So if I say that 80% of the opportunities that I take in from the business move it into the pipeline stage, okay, like what does that mean for the business? Does that mean we are not seeing enough or we're not rejecting enough? Uh, as they move from pipeline into actual sourcing activity, that's gonna give me a measure of how much my team can handle at any given time. And even if you're in a sales organization, you're looking at that in terms of what is the quality of the information I'm getting at the top of the funnel? And what's getting kicked out, what's getting accepted? Uh, as you come through that, then you can start get to the next level of metrics around how many opportunities am I creating or is the business sending in over a given period of time? And that gets back to the, the metric that Beam was able to move with the two times more projects initiated. You know, how can we look at that as a way to see how much of the business are we touching? And then, of course, how many activities do I have or how many touch points in a given project over a period of time? This would be akin to a sales manager saying, all right, you have this opportunity in pipeline. How many times have you talked to the key stakeholders there in the last two weeks? When is your next touch point? It's a great way to identify what's active versus what's actually passive in the pipeline. And then when you start looking at your team, Brian, you mentioned that you don't have kind of traditional categories, but you have people who would go from glass to software to shipping and logistics from time to time. Uh, you can look at those categories of opportunities that are coming in and do a little bit better of your resource planning along the way and find those, those bottlenecks. And then ultimately, as you start looking at optimization, the things that are going to be most valuable, how long do you my sourcing activities today at each given stage of my pipeline process. How many of those opportunities are stuck? Basically, if I know my average amount of time that something sits in negotiation, and I have, and that's 30 days, whatever it happens to be, and I have a couple of opportunities that have been in that stage for 60 days, something is wrong or something is broken in that part of the process, and I can dig in and fix it and change the way that we buy at the end of the day. And then finally, as we talked about those conversion rates on the way through, you want to look at the losses as much as the wins and really identify what happened in that process and use that as a way to define uh, where we go next. So as a pulse check, as we kind of land the plane on our, on our conversation here, uh, this is our second and final poll that we're going to share out here. Uh, so if you could take a sense uh, and a second and let me know, 
We talked about tools and why you're looking at tools at the beginning. This one is a lot more about where are you in your journey for transformation. Are you early on still establishing those fundamentals in terms of what you want to accomplish, uh, what your end game looks like, and what the steps along the way? Are you building that groundwork for building systems and processes in, in new ways? Are you all the way down the path of now repeating that process and working on efficiency? Or are you in the situation where Brian has built, brought his team, where you've really made that shift to total value delivery? I'll give you a couple seconds to self-reflect and put that in. Uh, Brian, how, as we, we wait for this, how long did it take you again to get from we need to revisit our processes and tools to that, that 2x improvement in throughput? So, I mean, that's honestly, it's about a two-year, you know, view uh, when we think about it. You know, but I will say, you know, the, you know, fully transformed, you know, I don't know that we, we'd ever want to even tell ourselves that we're fully transformed or, you know, we are transformed, you know, fully transformed and then there's a new target and that's kind of that, you know, continuous improvement mindset we, we try to, to bring forward and the curiosity to improve. So uh, by no means do we, we think, okay, two years and we got it knocked down. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a process to, to keep going through. Definitely. I love that. Thank you. Uh, but most health teams are still on this process, too. You, you still see new, new versions of the pipeline coming out on a regular basis. All right, this is great. Looks like we've got most of you in. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and if we look across this, a decent distribution, uh, but a lot of folks are – still establishing some of these fundamentals. We, we think about that as starting to make the step from a more transactional sourcing and procurement function to one that's a little bit more operational. Uh, it's a great time to establish some of those baseline metrics, kind of observe what you're doing, and then figure out where you need to go to align better with the business. Once you have that, you can kind of step into this next third of people who are building that groundwork and starting to operationalize some of these, uh, really get to scale in a lot of organizations. And then if you're at that point, uh, the one in five of you who are developing that repeatable process and enhancing efficiency, that's fantastic. This is where those tools really come into their own. Uh, once you've built and designed that process, now you can start measuring and optimizing and finding those areas for improvement. Uh, and then I'm, I'm a little jealous of those who are at that, that that full transformational stage. That's the really exciting part where we start to see next stages and careers unlock and, and big, big changes for organizations. All right, great. So thank you for sharing that. I think as we, we look to wrap up here, that is a – these reasons in this conversation is the reason that Scout was founded and the reason that we are so obsessed with making customers like, like Beam and others so successful. We were started with the idea of making – the commerce between businesses faster, safer, and more transparent. And a core component of that was building a tool that could accomplish this pipeline process. Really thinking about the process transformation and easy implementation that can get people out of tribal knowledge, disconnected spreadsheets, and way too many emails, and really put things into a single and streamlined and simple platform uh, to help drive this whole process. The scope of what we can help customers do uh, started with this idea of how can we improve sourcing events, uh, but very quickly evolved into the left-hand side of this chart, which is thinking about how do we collaborate better with the business and get better information at the top of the sourcing funnel with intake? How do we give people the right nudges and the right path to give us as much information as possible about an opportunity and help sourcing teams spend more time on the valuable parts of the job? And then the pipeline and savings tracking component, which is really home base for a lot of sourcing organizations and thinking through exactly how are we going to design and customize this process for our business and making that not so rigid, uh, but simple, addressable, and measurable. And most recently, we've been focusing on the, the latter half of that pipeline. As you look at negotiation, contract management, obligation management, and then ultimately the process of managing the relationship and engaging with suppliers over the long run. I really think about what we think of as post-sale in the pipeline model. 
Uh, to date, we've had the privilege uh, of working with customers in a host of industries. Uh, you'll definitely see a lot of hospitality, food and beverage, and uh, consumer packaged goods here, but also in retail, in finance. Uh, I really like talking with our healthcare and biotech customers because uh, it feels like we're having an impact on multiple levels, both helping them grow a small innovative organization, but ultimately having a personal impact on the lives of the people that they're working to treat. Uh, and companies large and small. And we really brought a pride to bring a, a, that very customer-centric approach. And that's why we're very proud in the last month to have received Gartner's uh, Customer's Choice Award for strategic sourcing platforms. Uh, this is not an analyst rating. This is truly sourced from customers and users of the platform who have come in and provided their unvarnished opinions about platforms. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, independent of Scout, it's an amazing resource for shortlisting and evaluating new suppliers. Uh, it's better than most of the other platforms out there uh, simply because of the editorial rigor and review that Gartner brings to the process, uh, but also the size of the community of your peers who are there. So whether you're looking for sourcing or if you're trying to help uh, get ahead of your marketing and sales and IT teams, it's an amazing resource for finding who are the companies we should be talking to because they collaborate well as a supplier. The last thing, Chris, before I invite you back on and, and Brian as well to work through the large number of questions I see we had is that we are continuing this conversation and even this specific conversation at Spark, uh, which is our sourcing event in February of 2019. It's going to be here in San Francisco uh, and invite all of you to look it up and consider joining us. In addition to uh, Brian, I believe, is going to be there as well. We're going to be hearing from Jeff Immelt, who's the former CEO of GE and how he drove a digital transformation at the world's largest and most valuable company, uh, as well as detailed deep dives into things like negotiation strategy, uh, bid optimization, uh, and some of these more pipeline sourced topics. Uh, so really looking forward to having as many of you there as possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Grant, and thank you, Brian, for a great presentation. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A session, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window, or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and then click the Submit button. Please note that we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left. If we're not able to get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. So let's go ahead and get started with our first of many, many questions, and we encourage you to keep submitting your questions as we'll get to as many of them as we can here. Uh, our first question is uh, for Brian. What products uh, from the Scout platform are you using? Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, give me a, an easy one to start with. You know, so mostly we are using the, the pipeline, uh, which, you know, is really the day-to-day, the -day, uh, you know, focus. Uh, but then we're also uh, quite active in the, uh, the RFP uh, section. Um, so really those two are the main ones, uh, the, the contracting um, area as well as some of the SRM capabilities uh, we're still evaluating. All right, thank you, Brian. We have another question here that's thrown out to either one of you. How do you qualify, or excuse me, quantify and track the ROI on projects where savings are not the focus, for example, complexity reduction? Hey, Chris, this is Brian. I'll take that. So it's, it's uh, not going to be a straightforward answer, but how, you know, tracking something that's not inherently easy to track always you know, in my mind, takes a little bit of a, of a leap of faith and uh, you know alignment with stakeholders. Uh, but one of the ways we are we are thinking about you know value that's not savings is you know we're tracking you know do we have less downtime on a line? Um, do we have less grade changes or less components uh, or less variability of components? And so we track some of those metrics, and although it's not always straightforward to tie those to dollars. Again, it kind of links back to the, you know, the dollars is the output. Um, if we know we're impacting some of the inputs, we know the dollars or the quality uh, will follow. And so that's really an engagement uh, back up through our senior leadership um, to say, hey, we value 
things that improve our quality or that reduce complexity for an operator. And we know that when we do those, we'll have a, you know, a positive outcome uh, in the end. So, so we do measure those, um, but we don't always convert those into to hard dollars. Yeah, and I Thank think you, if I can, oh, go ahead. yeah, if I can add on to that, Chris. Sorry, uh, there's a there's a few ways to go about this. Uh, one is certainly what Brian said and tie those up to the bigger strategic initiatives. Uh, there's definitely strong ROI in things that may be related to risk or to supplier diversity. And your finance team or even your product and sales team may have some good hard metrics that you may be able, may be able to tie to that. Uh, I know we have a number of customers who look at what is the cost of losing or churning out a supplier. And so they know if they can keep engaged with the current suppliers that they do have, that has the result of both top-line revenue for their ability to go to market more efficiently, as well as a reduction of the, the cost of onboarding a new supplier, which can be significant in many ways. Uh, we, we do this very frequently with both customers and prospects. We call it our value assessment. We actually have a team here dedicated to identifying both the hard and soft ROIs of this kind of a transformation. So if that's something that you're interested in, I'd be happy to, I'll put my contact information up at the end, but I'd be happy to introduce you to that team. All right, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Grant. Uh, our next question here says, outside of technology, are there any areas of business that are ripe for change that may be uh, simpler to engage in agile mindset or maybe less risky? Interesting. Uh, I can start with that one. Um, I, and so I, I'll try to answer this a couple ways. Cause I'm not sure if you mean that is technology the best path to drive a, a, a transformation of, of the technology itself, or are there other business units outside of sourcing and procurement that are, that are ready to go? I think we've seen this progression starting from sales, at the, basically starting from the front lines of the business, top line driven, sales into marketing, then into things like IT and collaboration that support that. Uh, security went through this five or six years ago. I do think that sourcing and procurement from what we're seeing is that next organization that is poised for change. Uh, there was a really interesting report from Bain uh, in the last couple months that looked at the most uh, adopted or most used management tools in the organization. And they actually called out sourcing and procurement and cost management as something that's rising to the top now in senior leaders' attention. And that's odd because we're in a period of growth. And that's normally a downturn. But what they're seeing is that by working with suppliers, uh, by building more efficient processes in this part of the business, it actually unlocks the next area of sustainable growth. Uh, so I think that's there. Uh, if you look at other areas, though, beyond technology, I think hiring and onboarding new employees is also an area that is right for change. And applying some of these processes to how you source new recruits, bring them onto the team, and get them ready to go. Uh, and, and tools and technology along the lines of what Brian talked about are, are a critical tool for getting somebody to productivity a lot faster. All right. Thank you, Grant. We'll move on to another question here for you, gentlemen. Uh, okay, this one says, how did you, con how did you con or how did you convey the value uh, add to automating procurement to leadership? Hey, Chris, this is Brian. I'll take that one. And I think my answer may not work, <laughs> and I wish it did, but I don't know if it'll work for everybody on the line. But we took a, a view that was less numbers-based and, and more philosophical-based. Um, because at the end, I, I found it difficult to say uh, running an RFP through Scout delivers an extra 5% value. Um, you know, I don't know that I could stand up and, and say, hey, that's, that's, a, that's something that I can tell you as a, as a firm member. But it was, it was more on this concept of, you know, how does a truck driver drive a truck if he, doesn't, if he wasn't taught how to drive a truck, if he doesn't have, you know, headlights in his truck. I mean, these are certain things that, uh, you know, you need to drive a truck. Right, you need gasoline in the, in, or diesel in the, in the truck. And everybody knows this, right, because trucks have been around for a while and everybody can see them and they're very obvious. And, and to me, it's very similar with procurement. And it's, 
well, how do you do this right if you don't even know, you know, what are the biggest opportunities and you don't have visibility to what everybody's working on? These are critical aspects of just doing the job. And so we said, hey, clearly if, if we want to have optimal results, you know, this is kind of the, the, the cost of doing business. Um, and, and at a minimum, this is where, where you should be. Otherwise, we're, we're not really, you know, doing our job. And it was that view, you know, that we had was, you know, if we want a sustainable, you know, procurement team that can deliver value year over year over year uh, versus just, you know, uh, try to get some quick wins in a year, um, then, then we need something that's going to last uh, last for a, a period of time, and that's that was brought in by leadership, and uh, it was a, a great thing that they that they understood it and and, and really aligned to it. Um, but it was less about, you know, dollars and facts and more about uh, philosophy. All right. Thank you, Brian. We're going to move on to another question here. And our next question for you, uh, gentlemen, what criteria is used to prioritize and deprioritize projects? Is it uh, savings potential, stakeholder readiness, support, or something else? Hey, Chris, I'll take that one again. Um, for sure, at the beginning, it's you know savings or value potential. Uh, but you know what, what we talked about earlier was half of the projects we start, we we don't finish, which is maybe unusual, but that's the the way we operate. And so we might see things that look really big, but very quickly we identify you know stakeholders not ready, um, you know it, it doesn't align to. Uh, uh, to the capabilities of the organization or the market's not ready for what we want to do. And so then we put it on hold or we cancel. Uh, but definitely the the initial read of, you know, what do we start to dig into, and again, we try to look at these very quickly and churn through them, uh, is around value potential. Um, and, and so bring that to savings. Uh, the other piece, though, that might be equal or even higher is risk. So, you know, if we see a big risk, you know, due to, uh, you know, commodities, uh, you know, or, or quality, those two would always take precedence over a project, you know, that's got savings. And, uh, you know, companies, you know, if you look at the, a lot of history of companies, you know, they don't, you know, suffer, you know, quick downturns because they didn't buy some, they bought something for 5% too much. It's you know, the risk of a, of a huge commodity swing or a big quality, you know, recall, um, you know, that drives, you know, sustainability issues for a company, uh, company's future. And so those, those always drive uh, priority. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, looks like we have time for maybe just one more question here. We're going to go ahead and try and sneak this one in. Can you please elaborate on, uh, on, on procurement and how it helps to create brand? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, Brian, I think you've got a pretty good perspective on this. I, I think there's two things that, that we see. Um, so if we look across all of, uh, of our customers, they are very brand-centric organizations. So I won't go back to the slide, but if you're in consumer packaged goods, retail, hospitality, uh, tech, uh, fashion, like brand is first and foremost how you go to market in, in many ways. And there, there's two things that support that. One is how do you deliver on the quality aspect? And Brad, I think you could probably talk to that better than, than I can. But working with your suppliers to ensure that every touch point of your product, whether it's the indirect services and capabilities you put behind your team to make them effective when they're in front of a customer, uh, down to the, the, the marketing services that you do impact and making sure you've got good criteria and good evaluations there. Uh, but then also just the overall performance management over time to make sure that you are delivering the materials and the quality and above all the innovation from your supply chain uh, that ultimately supports the brand experience that you're trying to deliver. Yeah, right, just to, you know, to add add into that, you know, our our view is, you know, fostering development of you know creative and curious people, you know, attracts the right people to procurement and, and gets a, a seat at the right tables. In doing so. You know, we, we help create the brands and we help bring ideas and we bring ideas from our supplier partners 
And we always kind of think of this that, you know, if I've got, you know, 100 suppliers and they all have, you know, 50 engineers, I'm not going to, uh, you know, do the math, but it's, you know, it, it extrapolates very quickly from just, you know, what do we have internally and, uh, you know, that's, that's how we help create uh, and support our brands. All right. Thank you, Grant and Brian. Uh, that is all the time that we have for questions for today. If we did not get to your questions, someone will be getting back to you uh, after the program is over. I'd like to thank Brian Golden of Beam Centauri and Grant Shirk uh, of S Scout RFP. On behalf of the Institute for Supply Management and Scout RFP, we'd like to thank our audience for your participation in today's event. This concludes today's program. We'd like to thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.